Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. We have now the pleasure to welcome Mr. Thomas Sweet, presenting to us his project, A Holiday from Being Human. Thomas, a man who decided one day to design and bring to life artifacts to go back into nature, a man who became, as he says himself, goat man. Thomas Sweet is a speculative designer passionate about technology, science, and the future of research. After his book titled, titled uh, The Toaster Project, depicting his attempt to make an electric toaster from scratch, his new book, Gottman, is now available. Please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Mr. Thomas Sweet. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. Um, I'm going to try and... Yeah, so... Um, Thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned, but I'm currently visiting professor at RISD, and so it's nice to be asked to come back to Europe. Um, and I just thought um, I'd start uh, with a project I wasn't going to show. It's kind of a, 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 an old project, but um, I thought I should put it in um, because of the kind of line of questioning after Kevin Slavin's properly amazing um, work. So uh, yeah, so I'll just start with this and then talk about um, becoming a goat. How might it become a police matter if people are growing genetically modified plants? Yeah, it would become a police matter if they're genetically modifying plants, um, say for example for the infr infringement of intellectual properties, um, cultivating illegal substances, um, where it, c it can be deemed as malicious. Um, and the cross-pollination of these, these items into foodstuffs, for example, um, can cost millions uh, and millions of pounds. How do you know where, where pollen has come from? Well, what, what happens really is that when the, when the bee has been foraging about and then returns back to the hive, um, if, if the bee has been successful in attaining pollen, um, what will happen is that the bee will do what we call a waggle dance. Now, the hive will pick this up because there's a, a video camera in each hive. And then what we're able to do is to decode that to tell us where the location of the pollen is. We use bees because they're a natural resource. Um, we don't have the time or money um, to use human beings. Um, and of course, bees can go anywhere they want. They roam about. So they can go through windows, into gardens, quite freely houses. Um, whereas, and they don't need warrants, whereas we would, and for the time for us to gain a warrant of entry takes a lot of time, a lot of bureaucracy. So the, the time that's saved through that and the money, we can put police on the streets where they need to be seen. The view from up here is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's one of the perks of the job, I like to call it. And the other thing is that the bees don't talk back. <laughs> Um, <coughs> yeah, so that was a, a snippet of a project um, called Policing Genes, and um, yeah, it was kind of getting at that idea that, um, yeah, using bees as kind of collectors um, to uh, keep track of the kind of genetics um, growing in kind of uh, in an urban environment. Um, yeah, and unfortunately for the gentleman who was asking the question about his his uh, stash or his um, his plants, um, I was asked to Scotland Yard to show that project. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just thought I'd put that in. But um, I'm I would like to talk about this project I did much more recently. Um, but I thought I'd start with a little bit of kind of near history. Um, this is um, Stellark um, wearing his third hand, which um, he was uh, sort of making in the 1980s. Um, and yeah, and I just kind of put this in because I suppose, you know, kind of three decades um, later, um, uh, you know, our kind of technology, our augmentations, our, the augmentation of our reality is kind of getting closer and closer to our bodies in, you know, it's be, uh, being inserted into our bodies. Um, and I was just, you know, and it 
strikes me that we are already kind of post-human or, you know, we're, of course, it's a, a continuum. Um, and, um, and I, you know, and, um, and so on this continuum, I suppose, if we are already post-human um, and dissatisfied, well, perhaps um, it's kind of better uh, we're better than just a, a mere human who is satisfied, um, and so on, down this chain of satisfaction, um, which was asserted by John Stuart Mill um, when he was trying to kind of establish his, um, his moral philosophy of utilitarianism. And I guess kind of satisfaction is where um, I begin my project to become a goat. Um, this is Noggin, um, he's my niece's dog, and he's a very happy, satisfied animal. Um, and I was looking after Noggin at a period in my life um, where I wasn't particularly satisfied. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, had that thought like, oh, you're so lucky, you stupid mutt. Um, you don't know how lucky you are. And it's a thought that I've had, you know, I'm sure many of us have had, you know, kind of at various points, but mostly in childhood, you know, looking at the pet cat who doesn't have to go to school. And so this dream kind of came back to me, this dream of becoming another animal to escape my kind of humanness, you know, freedom, just leave it all behind, like the ultimate holiday. Um, and so this dream, you know, I guess, um, because I'm a kind of designer artist, I did a sort of funding application, and to my surprise, I got some money to try and fulfill this dream of becoming a different animal. Um, and I began by thinking I was going to try and become an elephant, um, but very soon I realized that trying to become an elephant to kind of es escape existential angst was not a um, very uh, useful thing to do because elephants are one of the only other species on the planet that it's thought that may have um, consciousness of certainly some kind, but they exhibit kind of uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress. They live in, you know, um, complex social high groups called families, and that was exactly the kind of thing I was trying to escape from. So... Um, so I was a bit kind of flummoxed talking to a friend in a pub. Well, oh, I've got this money to try and become another animal, but I don't know which animal I should try and become. Um, woe is me. Um, and uh, he, she made a very good suggestion that I go and see an expert on human animal transformations. So she put me in touch with a friend of hers who's a shaman who lives in Copenhagen. So I went off to visit her in her kind of commune. Thank you. Wow, it's an amazing little community, sort of, of houses Sorry, and so on. Uh, okay. Um, is it okay if I film in it? Or is what? it? Is it okay if I film video things? Um. No. <laughs> um, yes, shamans have no need to document uh, every moment, unlike kind of artist designers. But um, basically, we had this conversation, and she told me I was an idiot for thinking I could become an elephant. Of course, I couldn't become an elephant. I was far too kind of domesticated. Elephants were so you know far removed from my environment. Um, so we went through this kind of, you know, what animals could I become, um, having you know been born and raised in London. So. We talked about foxes, but you know, still too wild. Um, deer, still too wild. Um, and uh, she suggested a sheep, and I was, you know, my heart sank because who wants to be a sheep? And then she said goat, and when she said a goat, I was like, that's it. That's the animal I want to try and become. Um, and um, yeah, and she also pointed out, of course, that it's not a new. It wasn't a new thing. Um, you know, people have been dreaming of becoming animals um, probably for as long as we've been kind of, uh, 
you know, um, in terms of our uh, kind of mind, at least, um, uh, for as long as we've been human. Um, because I think possibly um, this guy was referenced um, in a talk by Marguerite um, yesterday. I was asleep, literally asleep um, yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but this is the Lion Man, um, found very near here, I, th I think. Um, and uh, yeah, carved kind of 40,000 years ago. Um, and you know, you can fast forward all the way through prehistory, through classical history, um, all the way to the present day. And you know, this kind of, this dream of experiencing the world from another being's point of view um, it persists. So my project became um, basically this investigation into what modern science and techno technology have to say about this ancient, possibly the oldest human dream. Um, so I went to, st I started going to visit various kind of uh, people with expertise um, in this matter. This is um, Dr. McElliot at Queen Mary University, who's a kind of goat behavioral psychologist. And we went to visit his, his research subjects. Um, and, you know, as we wandered through kind of this, this goat heaven, um, he kind of explained to me, you know, I was asking these, you know, naive questions like what makes me different from a goat? Um, and, you know, what makes my consciousness different from a goat? And he suggested that um, it was, you know, as far as we know, or our best guess, um, I can, um, our best guess perhaps is uh, that it's our kind of, one, our ability to kind of, you know, think in stories, um, and to uh, our kind of ability to use language. Um, so then, okay, I thought, okay, I need to, to switch off these abilities, um, you know. Um, so I went to visit a neuroscientist, um, this is Dr. Devlin at UCL, um, and asked him, okay, I need you to switch off my ability to kind of think in stories, to use stories. I need you to remove my ability, my uh, my um, episodic memory, um, and I need you to remove my ability to uh, use language. Um, can you do it? And he said, well, I could, but um, it would involve giving you a lobotomy, and you wouldn't be coming back from that. Um, but uh, what he could do, which was reversible, is he could perhaps interrupt my ability to um, vocalize um, and uh, so that's what he tried to do using a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, basically putting a strong electromagnet um, over the scalp um, and switching on the current briefly, uh, which then, send, which then uh, generates a kind of electromagnetic field which penetrates um, to the cortex, the upper layer of the brain. Um, and interferes with the electrical activity of the neurons in a particular patch of cortex. So he was targeting a patch of my cortex called Broca's area. Um, and yeah, so there's a, kind there's a, of. Non zero, but very small risk that TMS can induce a seizure. So that's the hardcore risk. So this is the TMS coil. It's on and it's set so that it'll do stimulation. If I step on this, you can hear it, it makes yeah. a clicking noise. Yeah. Basically because the magnetic field sort of comes on and off so quickly that it actually creates what are called the Rentz forces that make a physical sound. So should the, um, who's that trip tracking over my bridge? <laughs> yeah. So we tried this again and again and again and we sort of got it, I think, but it was just, extremely uncomfortable um, because it also interferes with the activity of the nerves running into your teeth. Um, and I couldn't wait to get out of there, to be honest. Um, and the next day, one of my fillings fell out, which a uh, metal filling, which I kind of um, uh, <laughs> possibly think was related. Um, but of course, you can't just be a, a bodiless mind. Um, and I thought, OK, so. I need to also change my body. Um, and given that we're kind of next door on the phylogenetic tree, 
humans and goats, I thought that this would be a fairly easy thing to do, um, just to kind of rewind a few million years of evolution and kind of regain my ability to be a quadruped. Um, so I went to the workshop um, and kind of started mocking up some amazing prosthetics. Um, and this is a kind of early version. So <laughs> I need some help again, um, and I've, I'd seen the amazing videos of the kind of quadruped robots, um, terrifying. Um, so I tracked down somebody who um, worked on them, and uh, this is Professor Hutchinson, who runs the Structure and Motion Lab at the Royal Veterinary College, and kind of uh, confronted him with my um, theory that uh, given all the kind of homologous anatomy between humans and goats, it should be fairly easy to kind of, for me to become a goat. Um, he pointed out that we have homologous anatomy with, you know, every other sort of creature um, on the planet almost. Um, and uh, he said that basically my human body would be kind of considered baggage in the quadruped robotics field. It's kind of easier to start from scratch than to kind of um, adapt this um, already highly evolved um, sort of upright posture I have. Um, but again, we were kind of went on a little tour through his workspace. It gets a little bit um, kind of grisly uh, briefly from now on. And he was in the middle of um, dissecting a snow leopard um, which was, you know, quite an amazing thing, given that snow leopards are, um, there's only a few of them left in the world. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I said, okay, so how many goats have you dissected? And he said, none. Um, and I said, if I could get a dead goat, could we dissect one? He said, sure. Um, so I started thinking, where could I get a dead goat from? Um, so I went back to Dr. McElliot um, and asked if... I could ha uh, sort of have one of his goats, um, well, they're not his goats, but one of the goats he works with, um, should one die? Um, and after a kind of discussion, he said yes. Um, and so this is Venus. Um, Venus was suffering from a, a disease of the gut, um, a wasting disease, um, and uh, so she died. Um, and unfortunately, she died on a Sunday, um, so she had to spend the night in my fridge. But then the next day, we took her to the Royal Veterinary College and then kind of began this process that not many of us see these days, I think. Um, you know, this kind of process of an animal turning into um, something that we would kind of, you know, be more familiar with um, kind of at a butchers or a supermarket. Um, but it was basically like this kind of wonderful exposure to the, um, you know, the intricacies of evolution versus sort of, you know, engineering. Um, and, uh, you know, went back to the lab, but r realized, I mean, the workshop, but realized, um, yeah, I need some more help. Um, so I contacted some um, prostheticists, um, this is Dr. Heath um, and his technician, Jeff, and kind of went up for a consultation um, and they agreed to make me some prosthetics. Um, and so we kind of spent um, an afternoon with me kind of clomping around the clinic, um, getting kind of uh, fitted for some um, kind of prosthetic uh, sort of additional um, goat legs and arms. Um, but I realized I wasn't going to be very free if um, I, you know, had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. Um, and goats, of course, they can uh, survive off grass and foliage. Um, and uh, the reason they can do that is because they have um, a whole kind of extra organ, a rumen. And, um, a, you know, and we don't, we can eat as much grass as we like, but we can't digest it. So I needed an artificial rumen. And there are labs um, working um, to create artificial rumens. This is the um, 
uh, ruminant biology lab at the University of Aberystwyth. And I went up there with a, a silicone bag I'd made um, and explained that what I'd like to do is uh, I would have this silicone bag strapped to my torso um, and then I could take a bite of grass, chew it up, spit it into one end of the bag, and then if they could just give me um, a sample of the fluid from inside a uh, goat, some of this rumen fluid, I could culture it um, in this bag, and then from the other end kind of suck out this sort of uh, fermented sort of grass milkshake, which I could then digest um, using the stomach acid in my stomach. Um, they didn't agree, and I had to try and get some enzymes um, to do that. It's a different thing if you're kind of ex uh, experimenting on yourself. But eventually, I needed to go uh, to the Swiss Alps, um, so just uh, along the way from here, um, to a goat farm where I tried to join the herd, the herd of this wonderful um, goat herd called Sep. And I'm kind of rushing a bit because I can see this big countdown. And for a, a while, it was kind of wonderful. Like, I was kind of running with the herd. Um, but uh, basically, all too soon, these kind of clunky prosthetics um, that I had um, just became extremely painful. Um, and the kind of herd of goats disappeared over the horizon. Um, they were just so agile. Um, I didn't have a hope um, in keeping up, but I guess I just kind of plodded along. You know, this dream of galloping away was like, just died. Um, but eventually, I kind of caught up with the um, herd of goats. Yeah, so, yeah, I was there, I was at the goat farm for three days and three nights, and then I had to kind of branch out on my own um, and try and cross the Alps. I put that in the funding application um, that I was going to cross the Alps. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd end, like, this is like an absurd kind of humorous thing and part of it, and it's kind of meant to be, I suppose. I, like, you know, sort of wanted this to, like, cross out of the gallery and I kind of wanted to put a little bit of like fun or humour back into this there vision the of the future. Um, um, so you, you know, know and so I sort does. of it was quite so you know, could, you know I'm trying to turn it down quite fun to like be on the kind of the couch on morning T V sort of talking about you know this well, uh, this project I'd done. Yeah, and I guess it's also about this sort of you know, how does the future look, the aesthetic of the future. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to imagine like this twee sort of future of, um, you know, having a holiday as a goat um, rather than this kind of future of like better, faster, kind of more productive. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it there. This is just a kind of local news channel where the presenter kind of found it extremely funny, but um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>